Good evening. Welcome to the Thursday night Bible study and our journey through the Bible. The book of Revelation. Part seven tonight. There are three major subjects that I thought we should cover from the book of Revelation. We're going to try to get to at least two of those three tonight, maybe all three. I think it's doubtful we will get to all three. But one of those subjects is that there are, as we studied, these two witnesses that we studied last week in the Great Tribulation. God has two witnesses. Satan has two witnesses. And those two witnesses, I believe the scriptures conclusively prove, are Moses and Elijah. And we looked at that last week. But these are not the only witnesses that are in the Great Tribulation for God. There are others that are defined as servants of God. And there are a specific number of those. Not to say there are not others, but there are 144,000 servants of God identified in two different chapters of the book of Revelation. We're going to look at these tonight. The 12,000 of each tribe of Israel. The second thing we're going to take a look at tonight is there is a great city, and God calls it over and over again, a great city. And the angels refer to it that way, and other witnesses that you read about in the book of Revelation refer to it as a great city. And I want you to think about this. God has a city on this earth. Jerusalem. And the earthly Jerusalem is a foreshadowing of a greater Jerusalem. That is the new Jerusalem that God is going to bring down from the sky, the largest city that you could ever imagine, bigger than all the cities in the world put together. That happens after the millennial reign of Christ. You've got the new Jerusalem. So God has a city, Jerusalem. He's going to rule from Jerusalem when he returns to this earth at the end of the Great Tribulation. But he has another city, New Jerusalem, is going to come down from heaven, which is defined as the Bride of Christ. But what we're going to study tonight, the second subject tonight, Satan also has a city. Satan has a city that he is called the king of that city, and that's the Great Babylon. The book of Revelation and the Old Testament has a lot about Babylon. And there's different interpretations on what it means. I am convinced that the city Babylon is a city, a actual great city that will exist in the Great Tribulation. It is a satanical city. It is a wicked city. But that city is going to rule the whole earth via the Antichrist and the false prophet. And I think it's, some people interpret it to mean, it's not really a city. Babylon represents false religion. Babylon represents this and that and the other thing. Well, one thing it is clearly presented as in the word of God, at least four to five times in the book of Revelation alone, we're going to look at tonight, and it is a great city. And it rules the kings of the earth, the nations of the earth. It controls the economy of the world. And it rides into existence on the beast, the Antichrist, and Satan. So that's the second subject. If we get to it, subject number three. We didn't cover the final wrath of a righteous God, which are the final plagues of God that fill up the wrath of God. They're going to fall on these Satan worshiping, murderous, evil, and wicked people that are going to be on this earth in the great tribulation. We never studied that in the study of the book of Revelation. Maybe we'll get to it tonight. They're the final plagues of God. They are the vials of God's righteous wrath. We might not get to it tonight because there's a lot to cover about the first two subjects. So subject number one, who are these witnesses? The 144,000. 
Go to Matthew 24 and you see in verse 14 that the gospel of the kingdom, why don't we turn there? Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. The gospel of the kingdom is preached in all the world. There's no mistake about which gospel is going to be preached in all the world. It's the gospel of the kingdom. It's also known as the gospel of the circumcision. It's Israel's gospel. But it's preached to all nations. All the world it's preached in for a witness unto all nations. Who are these witnesses going to be taking it unto all nations in the great tribulation? We know this is the great tribulation Jesus is referring to because he called it that in Matthew 24. We've been over this so many times, but verse 21, for then shall be great tribulation such as were not, was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be, he refers to it as the end. It's the end of the world as we know it. Who are these witnesses? Well, we know Moses and Elijah are two of them, but they're witnessing from Jerusalem. They're not going out into all the world. Yes, you can watch them on the internet or TV or whatever's going to exist at that time. But I'm convinced 144,000 are also witnesses of God going out into all the world. And there's different groups. Matthew 10, you see there's one group that doesn't go through the cities of Israel until the second coming occurs. What are they preaching? He that endures unto the end shall be saved, just like you read about in Matthew 24. They've got to be faithful unto death. They've got to, you know, they're going to be teaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand because it will come as soon as the tribulation is over. Obviously, they're going to be teaching that they can't take the mark of the beast. They have to fear God and worship him as the angel that comes down from heaven teaches uh, in, the, in the tribulation period. It's all part of the gospel of the kingdom. But there's one group that goes to the cities of Israel. They don't even go through the cities of Israel until the second coming of Christ occurs. There's another group that goes out into all the nations, all of them, all over the world. And I think that's 144,000. Let's go to Revelation chapter uh, 50. Let me see. Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. It's in two different places, but we'll start in Revelation 7, where these 144,000 are referred to. Uh, Revelation 14 is the other one. Revelation 7. Verse 2. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. So the four angels are given power over the earth and the sea to cause harm to the earth and the sea. These are angels of God saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed. Notice that it's a specific number of people. Notice that they're referred to as the servants of our God. Notice that they cannot cause the damage to the sea and the trees until the servants of God are healed. And you can line up when that time period is because you'll see a third of the oceans are turned into blood when the trumpets of wrath fall, not when the seals are unloosed, where there's a famine, pestilence, and conquering, those other things, but when the trumpets of wrath fall, a third of the oceans turn into blood. Then later, when what we haven't studied yet, the last plagues fall, all of the oceans are turned into blood. So you can time when this is occurring on the earth. It's after the seals are loose. Well, 
The seals go over and are more of a summary in Revelation 12, but focus on the, the seals that famine and the beginning of sorrows where the oceans are not damaged, they're not hurt as it says here until later in the great tribulation. What is the number of them? Here's the number of these. The number of those which are sealed. Notice they're not sealed with the Holy Spirit. They're sealed with on their foreheads. They are sealed. The servants of our God in their foreheads. That's what they're sealed with. They're sealed with the, they're sealed on their foreheads. What are they? Who are they? And what is the number? They're defined right here. There are 144,000 that are sealed in verse 4 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. God is dealing to the nations through Israel. And I'm going to show you why I believe that. These are the witnesses that go out into all the world for a witness unto all the nations. And then shall the end come in Matthew 24, verse 14. Why do I believe that these are them? I'll show you at the end of this chapter why. But for now, there are 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Judah are sealed at 12,000. Of the tribe of Reuben were sealed 12,000. Tribe of Gad, tribe of Asher, 12,000. Nephilim, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Sometimes when the 12 are referred to, Ephraim and Manasseh are in there. Sometimes when the 12 are referred to, Joseph is in there. Sometimes Levi, Levi is not mentioned. Here, Joseph is in there and Levi is in there. And I don't see Manasseh and I don't see, maybe I skipped over them, Manasseh and Ephraim. Because they were sons of Joseph, but they are accounted as uh, part of the 12 tribes in some places. So they're sealed. And watch what happens after they're sealed. After this, I beheld. So it's not that necessarily it happens sequentially right away in time. But there's a connection there with these 144,000 and what is described in verse 9. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of Israel only? No, not of Israel only. Of all nations and kindreds, and people and tongues. And you're going to see this language a lot in the book of Revelation. You're going to see the nations and kindreds and tongues that everybody worships the beast, Satan's witness on earth, other than those that are written in the book of life, of all the kindreds and all the tongues and the nations. But notice there's another group that you can't even number all these nations, kindreds, and people and tongues. And they're standing before the throne of God. And before the Lamb. So they're up in heaven. Clothed with, clothed with white robes. And they have palms in their hands. Why are they up in heaven? Why do you think they're up there? Some people say, oh, this shows when the rapture is. They've been raptured mid-trib, pre-wrath. No, nothing in, nothing in Revelations indicates that. They're up in heaven. Because they came out of great tribulation. And they were martyred for God. They died for God. I believe they're the same ones that we're going to look back at in Revelations chapter 6. I believe it's verse 9 and 10 and see that they died, that they were killed for the testimony of God, for the word of God. That's why they're up in heaven. They were killed on earth. But they're from all nations, kindreds, and tongues. This to me connects 144,000 as witnesses of these people that have all been martyred, that are the witness that they're to witness that gospel of the kingdom in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And I believe they witness to all these people and these people decide, I'm going to have to die for Christ. I can't take the mark of the beast. I cannot deny Christ or else I'm going to lose my soul. I'm going to be faithful unto death. I'm going to endure on the end because I want to live forever. And they're killed. They, how do, how do we know they come, they come out of great tribulation? 
Let's, let's read on. So, so many, you, no man can number them. They're all nations, kindreds, people in, from, I'm sorry, of all nations, kindreds, and peoples, and tongues. And we know that the rest of the world is going to be worshiping the Antichrist, whose names are not written in the book of life. So these are of all nations, kindreds, and tongues. And they are before the Lamb, they're before the Lord Jesus Christ up in heaven. And they're upon the, th and they are saying salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and onto the lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne. So that's a scene in heaven where they're up there. There's a throne, there's a lamb, there's God and all the elders and the four beasts and the angels. It's the same scene. So we know they're up in heaven. And verse 13, and one of the elders answered, this is very important. One of the elders answered, saying unto me, that's John, what are these who are arrayed in white robes? Whence came they? Well, John doesn't know. So he says, and I said unto him, sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Came out of great tribulation. They're up in heaven. And I believe that they're synonymous with the ones in Revelation chapter 6. Let's turn back there. And let's go to verse um, turn to verse let me find this. I think it's verse 9 I said. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So they're up there in heaven. They were killed for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, does thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, just like what we read about in Revelation 7. White robes were given unto them. And it was said unto them, they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So there we see they were martyred uh, for the word of God and the testimony which they held. That's, they were slain verse 9. Now, you're going to see the 144,000 again. Why don't we turn over to Revelation chapter 14. And you're going to see these witnesses again. Start in verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion. And with him, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Remember how they were marked, sealed, uh, the seal of God in their foreheads? Well, now we know what it is. They have their father's name written on their foreheads, which God the Father. Now, here, they're standing. The lamb stood on Mount Zion with him, the 144,000. I think this is projecting forward as there are many events in the book of Revelation that project forward in time, goes back and forth and back and forth, back into the Great Tribulation, forward. And I believe this is projecting forward. All the 144,000, by the way, they will do the will of God. They have no fault in them. I think they're all going to be killed too. I could be wrong about that. I think they're going to be killed too. They're not among those. There are those in Judea that are not going to be the witnesses to all the world. And then shall the end come? How do I know that? Because those that are in Judea, there's a group in Israel, in Judea, that when the Antichrist gets in the holy place, Jesus Christ taught them in Matthew 24, flee into the mountains. That's the middle of the tribulation. They flee into the mountains and God Almighty protects them there. They're in the mountains of Judea, Judea being cared for by God. They are not going around the world preaching the gospel of the kingdom to all nations. But these, I believe, are the ones that do that. And then it projects forward and you see every one of them is faithful to God. And every one of them is with God, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he returns to the earth 
and he's on Mount Zion in Israel. They're with him there, 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now, there's an explanation about them in the ensuing verses. And there's a song that they only know, and then it gets back up to heaven again, where it, it, it's the, uh, uh, some things that are occurring up there and the four beasts and the elders and so forth. But that doesn't change the fact that verse one, they're down on the earth with the Lord. Obviously, when he returned, there he is on Mount Zion and they're with him. Watch what it says about them. Nobody learns this song, but these 144,000 in verse three, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Oh, they do the will of God. They follow the lamb, whithersoever he goeth. You got to understand something. People say salvation is always by grace through faith. And that's the only gospel throughout the Bible. And there's no works involved ever in salvation. Well, that's nonsense. Because these people are being martyred for God. They are killed and slain for the testimony of God for a reason. Because they must be faithful unto death. And if they are, then they eat of the tree of life and get eternal life. These here will do the will of God. They follow the lamb, whithersoever he goeth. They're redeemed from among men, and God defines them as having in their mouth was found no guile. They were without fault before the throne of God. And I believe, believe that's what they're going to be like on earth because God gives them a special tasting of the heavenly gift, and they're able to live their lives that way. Now, what's interesting, and I believe connected with the 144,000, is verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Oh, getting back to some people say there's only one gospel in the Bible. There are so many different gospels in the Bible. So that's not even an accurate or logical teaching. It shows biblical ignorance. It shows they were taught that. And so they superimpose that belief on everybody. Even when you share verses with them, they say, oh, no, that's wrong. There's only one gospel in the Bible. Well, look here. In verse 6, we, re we read about the 144,000, Revelation chapter 14. And then we get down to verse 6. And I saw an other angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. What is he saying? He's got it to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. I, presumably, he's preaching part of it right here. He's saying, is he saying, just believe that Jesus died for you and was raised from the dead. You're going to receive eternal life by grace through faith without works. It's not what he's preaching. Just like the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew 24. It had, didn't say anything about that. No, what he, this angel is preaching. Be careful about this. Those of you that believe there's only one gospel in the Bible that are listening to my voice. You read verse 6 and tell me that this is the same gospel that was given to Paul by revelation. That's found in 1 Corinthians 15. That this angel is preaching here. No, this is what he's preaching. It's not the same gospel. It's a different one. Having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth. And to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, here it is. Fear God. It's one thing. And give glory to him. That's another thing. For the hour of his judgment has come. In other words... The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's the gospel of the kingdom, purely, really. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains and waters. You got to fear God. You got to give glory to him. You got to worship him. But guess what happens if you do that? Guess what happens with the, the Satan and the beast and the false prophet are going to cause to happen to you if you do that? And you don't worship the beast or his image or all those other things or Satan. You're going to get killed. But you're going to know you got to do this. You've got to worship God. You've got to endure on to the end to receive eternal life. But here it is. Fear God. Give glory to him. For the hour is judgment to come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another angel saying Babylon has fallen, has fallen that great city. 
because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So we're going to get into Babylon now. That was our second subject. Oh, by the way, this we know this is synonymous with the gospel of the kingdom, that they're to this is this everlasting gospel given to the angel to preach to every nation, kindred, and tongue. We know it's the same because Christ told you that was the gospel that was going to be preached in all the world in Matthew 24. We just read that tonight. Well, let's get to our se second topic. I'm moving along rather quickly. This great Babylon. Go to Revelation chapter. Here we see it's fallen. It's fallen. This is language from the Old Testament. It's not new language. You read about Babylon is fallen. And in fact, I think very similar to this. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. I think it's even described in this way in the Old Testament. Here it's called a great city. Uh, she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. We're going to read about that. This language and this terminology, um, the wine of, and the wrath and her fornication in Revelation chapter 17. So let's turn there. Revelation 17. What do I think this Babylon is? Well, let's see what the, the Bible describes it to be. It is a mystery. But let's look at the description of it. It's defined in the Bible. So we don't have to guess what it is. Revelation chapter 17. Verse 1. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will shew unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, just like we read back there in that other chapter of the book of Revelation. And the inhabitants of the earth have made have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So there's no mystery about that, even though it is called a mystery. Let's see, how, let's jump ahead, see how it's defined, and then we'll go back and look at this in detail about this great city. Um, turn to verse 18 of Revelation chapter 17. Verse 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city. And we're going to see that the woman represents Babylon the great. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. It's a great city is what it is. It rules over the kings of the earth. Turn over to um, Revelation chapter 18. We're just shooting ahead and we'll go back and cover more ground in detail on this great city. Verse 10, Revelation 18, verse 10. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, lat, alas, that great city, Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Let's go to verse 18. And cried when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What city is like unto this great city? Verse 19 of Revelation 18. And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, alas, that great city wherein we were made rich. Go to verse 21. And a mighty, mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. You get the picture. So. One, two, three, four times we read it's a great city in the word of God. That a lot of people teach it's not. They'll teach it's not really going to be a city in the great tribulation. They teach that it represents um, religious wickedness and all the wicked religions of the world. And all the ungodly religions. Everything but the truth of God's word. There's an element of false religion in there for sure. Because fornication is technically often associated with idol temples. And that's how they'd worship these idols. They would do two things. They would sacrifice children, burn them alive, or kill them in some other way. 
to these devils, and that's what they'd be worshiping, devils. And they'd also commit fornication with the disease-infested, uh, vile prostitutes at these temples. So they would get all kinds of venereal disease. It was disgusting. They wouldn't live long, and they look horrible. Probably get AIDS and whatever else they caught from them. But that's how they worship. They would engage in child sacrifice and murder. You read in the book of Revelations, that's what these devil worshipers are doing. They're basically murdering. I'm sure the most innocent and, and easy people to murder are these little children. So, and they're engaged in devil, devil worship. So that's what it's associated with. Yes, but it's more than that. It is a real city, I believe, that's going to be there in the Great Tribulation. It's one reason I know that we're not in the Great Tribulation among many, many reasons. There's no great, great Babylon city. Right now, Babylon, there is a city in Iraq, but it's not a great city that rules the economy of the world. And you'll find out this city rules the economy of the world. And you'll find out this city murders off the saints around the world. And the blood of all these prophets and saints of God and believers in Jesus Christ during the Great Tribulation, they're murdered by this great city. You want to buy and sell? Babylon's going to control that. It's the seat of the beast. It's Satan's seat. And Satan is a king of this city. How do we know that? Book of, uh, Book of Isaiah chapter 14. Go back to Isaiah chapter 14. And if your Bible does not use the word Lucifer in here, I wouldn't use that Bible. I am very leery of any Bible that takes out the name Lucifer from Isaiah 14 and, and substitutes the name of Jesus Christ at the end of the chapter, the morning star. So it's a lot of Bibles do that. I don't use them for that re one reason alone is why I use a King James. Uh, I have many reasons, but Isaiah chapter 14, start in verse one. 